it really is devastating. Um, in every one of these expressions, you don't even have to say words, and you can see what those people are thinking just from the face. And so, of course, when because of an accident, you lose your hands or your face, it's devastating. It really, really is almost, you know, life threatening. This is Jackie. She came to the United States from Venezuela to study English for a summer. She was with her two girlfriends in a car and she was driving around and a drunk high school football player ran into their car. The car started on fire, burned everybody in the car. Jackie, when the, police, when the firemen got there, they thought she was dead. She looked like charcoal. And she survived, but the other two girls died. And this is Jackie today. So imagine if you had a face like that, and Jackie is a, she's a hero too, because I mean, she goes around and talks at schools and everything about drunk driving, against drunk driving. But that's how she ended up with, and what's most remarkable about this is that this is not right after the accident. This is after 40 operations. She has got the best care in the United States. She's been in Florida, she's been in Louisville, where we saw her with her eye problems. She has been in Cincinnati. She's been in the best care that the United States can provide, and that's the result. That's as good as it gets. <clears throat> so what are the current treatments? How do we treat people like that have these defects today? Well, when you cut your hand off, the best thing that they can do is if you put it in a plastic bag with ice and you bring it into the hospital, they reattach it, and that gives the best result of all. But a lot of times, if that if your hand gets caught in the machine or something, it's all ground up, you can't put it back on. So that's not an option. And in terms of the face, this is a little girl in India who got her braids caught in a machine that threads rice, and it tore her entire face off. And luckily, her mom put it in ice and took her on the back of a motorcycle to three different hospitals. None of them had the facilities to be able to treat her. Finally, the final hospital, they were able to, and they sewed her face back on. And look, I mean, that's a fantastic result right there. That's amazing result. OK, so how did they treat, treat Jackie? Skin grafts, you guys know what skin grafts are, where they take skin from somewhere else in your body, a very thin piece of skin, and then they put it on top to cover that. That's what she has had. She had, she has had that done from all parts of her body to cover that defect. This is another way that they do it. Surgeons can take the toe from your foot and put it up. And so now, if you're missing a thumb, so now he has a thumb. In this case, they take a big piece of skin from your back, the latissimus dorsi, and they lift it. They put it on the face. They cover the face. So John, they're using their own, own skin. This is their own skin. own skin. This is one of the treatments that's available right now. This was done by, actually, my wife's um, partner in Louisville a long time ago. My wife is a plastic surgeon. She does this kind of surgery. Um, but imagine <clears throat> that's, that's great that they covered the defect. But he looks like somebody who has a back on his face. So aesthetically, it's not a very good result. But actually, it's a fabulous result in this sense. He was in, on a motorcycle accident. He had a helmet on. It was gasoline, got in it, and burned all of his face. And so this is the result, a very good result, for treatments that we have today. Prosthetics, all of you have heard of bionic this and bionic that. Today, they do a very good job of building mechanical hands that you put on somebody. They work very well. Afterwards, they put rubber over them, and look how beautiful that looks. I mean, if I had a hand with a prosthesis like that, you couldn't even tell. So aesthetically, it's beautiful. The problem is it doesn't work. This one works, but of course, I don't know if you've seen people that have it. It's, it's not the same. In this case, this patient was treated in uh, Louisville. He had cancer of his nose in the middle of his sinuses. So they had to remove all the middle part of his face, 
then they put those metal things that which are like snaps, like on your shirt. So in the morning he gets up and he snaps that on, and that's what he looks like. So a prosthesis, again, it looks good, but it doesn't function. Another treatment, which is the one I presented about last time I was here, we helped develop this treatment. Um, and you can, this was our first patient. That is now 14, 13 or 14 years out. This is a transplanted hand that we got from a dead person that got in a car accident. We took off the hand, just like they do organ transplants. We got this from somebody, we put it on. This was like after a year, but now he's 13 years out. And he's doing great. This is some somebody, a fellow from um, Maryland, who uh, uh, one of my colleagues transplanted. This is what his face looked like. They took this face from a dead person, who was in an accident, put it on, and this is four years later. So look at that result. I mean, it's beautiful results. And the thing that's interesting is that he can also feel, he can also smile, he has function and everything. So this is a great, great uh, uh, treatment. And, um, but, like so all the treatments. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. how, long, how long can it take for a patient to be able to smile and feel, to really for the nervous sensation to come back? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because we had that question before we were going to do this. And what happens is nerves grow back at a certain mm -hmm. speed. In other words, if you cut your hand off and I put it back on, young people, within a year, you would have 90% function and sensation. If you're older, it takes longer. What is amazing about these transplant patients is one of the drugs that we give to them to suppress their immune system. There's three drugs. It's a cocktail. That's what we discovered in Louisville is this cocktail of drugs. One of those drugs, unbeknownst to us when we first did it, um, has the effect that it makes nerves grow faster. Hmm. And so, we were lucky that they got sensation and function back a lot quicker than they would had we had just put their own hand back on. So the drug itself promotes nerve growth. And the face, everybody has been astonished, astonished at how quickly they regain sensation and function and everything. Again, it's the drug that they're giving them that makes it go even faster. In the face, I mean, there are hundreds of nerves in the face. To make the face work, again, is quite a feat. And they've been very satisfied with how quickly they get function back, these transplants. Okay. Um, now I'm going to talk a little about, about the research that we did that led to the first face and hand transplants. It was in Louisville, Kentucky back in 1985, before you guys were born. Um, this hospital offered us to fund our research if we would do face transplants. Back then, nobody had ever done a hand or a face transplant. Actually, they funded us for hand transplant, not for face transplant, because in their hospital, they have a big hand care center. And so they wanted their hand care center to be the first to, be, to do hand transplants. So they offered to fund us to do that. We did a lot of research. This makes it look simple, but I put it all on one slide. <laughs> a lot of research, really a lot of research in rabbits and rats and cells and, pump and everything you can imagine. And what the big deal was there is that if I'm going to give you a hand, I don't want to have to give you a drug so you won't reject the hand for the rest of your life. And if the drug is really, really toxic, that's the big problem. If I told you, for instance, you need a heart transplant. If you don't get it, you're going to die. But you have to take toxic drugs the rest of your life. Would you do it? Maybe. Maybe. If you don't do it, you're dead. But if I, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. It's like you, you want to like, be a vegetable for the rest of your life. But isn't it, the drugs it? aren't that bad. It's the same as the people that have kidney transplants. Oh, it's not like... It's the same drugs. Same drugs. Oh, well, at the beginning you feel sick, you lose your hair, but afterwards oh, you get living. used to it. So, so, but there's no question that you would do that because it's the alternative is death. 
Okay, now I'll ask you. Let's say we cut your hand off, or you were in an accident and your hand got cut off. Then I say, okay, I can put a new hand on you, but you have to take the same drugs the rest of your life. Would you do it? Yeah. You would do it. Would you do it? See? And th you're not right and she's not wrong. Some people say, hey, I'll live the rest of my life without a hand. Well, what happens is that we as doctors are giving you a treatment that's not saving your life, but we're exposing you to drugs the rest of your life. So that's a big ethical problem. It's called the risk versus the benefit. So we did a lot of research on that whole thing of the risk versus the benefit. And that's that's a big deal, that's a big deal. And so, because of that, one of the ideas, Nick, could you come and keep this away, please? I'm sorry. Um, the, one of the big, one of the things that we did, just 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 sit there and keep it away. <laughs> There's a chair there. <laughs> I have buttons. to prop myself on that chair quite often. Um, but anyway, so so that's that is the question: is the risk versus the benefit? And it's a big, big question. A lot of the ethicists, when we said we were going to do this, said that we were we were criminals. We should not do this because we're Nick. Come on, please. No, no. All I did here just touch it every once in a while. Okay. Yeah, it just needs a little bit nudge. So, but, but anyway, so the big thing was, one of the things we were going to do is this is a pump. You can see that's a quarter, so you can see the size of the pump is like this. We were going to put the pump under the skin here, and that tube was going to give drugs just to the lymph. So that's where we would give most of the drugs, and the rest that came through would be minimal. So that was one way that we could stop the it from rejecting, but not expose the whole body to uh, to the immune suppression. We tried that. Our control group, you know, you guys know what a control group is, the one that is not supposed to work, the one you're going to compare it to. We just looked in the literature and found that in kidney transplants at that moment, they were using a cocktail of three different drugs. They were very powerful. Why? Because they attack the immune system in three different mechanisms of the immune system. So you could give them very low doses, so it wasn't very toxic, but it had a very powerful effect because of that. So that was our control group, and we planned the whole experiment. We knew what was going to happen. You put the pump in. This one was going to do great. The one that we put the pump in because we're giving the drug to it. And this one would reject because it wasn't good enough. After about two months, the pump started getting clogged up. And so I was flying all over the place to the company in Boston that made the pump or to the company that made the drug saying, why is your drug eating the inside of my pump, et cetera. My students came to me and said, look at the control group. It's beautiful. I go, no, no that can't be. That, that, that's ridiculous. That can't be. So we end the experiment. I'm still wrestling with trying to get the pump working. And sure enough, guess what? That combination of drug, we totally stumbled on it. That combination worked. Guess what? There's been 125, 150 of these done around the world now, and about 25 face transplants. They're all using that combination of drug. So that's how science happens sometimes, you know? I'd love to say, well, we thought because the mechanism, we totally stumbled on what is being used today for all the hand transplants in the world. And it's a combination. And then remember that question that you asked about one of those drugs, it's called tacrolimus, just happens to have an effect that it stimulates nerve growth. Another freebie. <laughs> we didn't have any clue that would happen. So anyway, OK, so um, do I dare? Nick, next slide, please. So using that drug combination, we went to our hospital. We got permission to be able to do 10 hand transplants. And uh, we presented our work at meetings and everything. People from France were in the audience and everything. They went home. They did hand transplants. We did hand transplants. And uh, in China, they did two hand transplants.
And so this was our hand transplant. This is a hand, again, taken from somebody that was died in a car accident. We put it on to Matt, that guy that you saw in the previous picture, and he is still happy with his hand. One of the things, going back to the importance of our hands, when, when I transplanted, about a year after transplanting these hands onto Matt, I asked him, what is the best part of having that hand transplant? What do you think he said to me? What, what do you your think? Function, your hand function? Yeah, now he can tie his shoe, now he can ride, now he can. He said, when I go to the supermarket, I can walk with my daughter holding her hand. Aww. Another thing, wearing his wedding ring. So again, it brings you back to wait a minute. That function, which is so much obvious, is, yeah, now I can tie my shoe, and no, he didn't care about that. What he cared about is feeling, and it was in his words, feeling whole. Having his own hand now, a real hand, not a prosthesis and all this stuff, now he felt whole. So again, that goes back to the importance of a hand. Well, imagine the face. Have any of you ever seen somebody whose face is destroyed? Mm -hmm. How did you feel? You, not the other person. What did you do? I don't know. I just couldn't believe it at first. But what did you do? Did you go up to him? Hi, how are you? And start talking? Um, Why? <laughs> how did you feel? Very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. okay. Very uncomfortable. Okay. And these people, yeah. then they go out in public because they usually lock themselves in their house and never go out because they're socially dead. But when they do go out, it's the little kids, mommy, mommy, look at that monster. Look, uh, 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 mommy, mommy. Imagine how that person feels. I mean, that is a horrible life. More because we are social animals. We need to interact with people. We need to talk to people. We need to. And this was the argument we made when we were saying that the risks are worth the benefits for a phase transplant. OK, next one. Next, please. Okay, the first face transplant was done soon after this. This is famous now. This woman, she was asleep, and her dog came and bit off oh, her face. Right. And they transplanted this. And wow. look at that result. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful result. And she still has that ever since uh, 2000. It looks good. She looks even better than that. That was two years out. Okay, next. Using the same drug cocktail that we stumbled on. So, today, when I made this slide, there had been more than 225 hand transplants done around the world. There's been more than 25 hand transplants. You can go to UCLA or you can go to Mayo Clinic and say, walk in the door and say, I want a hand transplant. And if you qualify, they'll give you a hand transplant. So it's not experimental anymore. You can get a hand transplant. So we took that with research, like you guys do here. We took it from an idea, trying it in rats, rabbits, in pigs, and all the way to humans, developing a, a treatment that today, that is a normal treatment. It's not experimental. Face transplants are still experimental, but there's good results. They're just a lot more complicated than doing a hand, but the results are pretty good. Okay, go ahead. What is the problem with hand and face transplants? Big, big problem. What were we talking about? What is the problem with doing drugs? It's having to take those drugs. That's a big trade-off. You have to take those toxic drugs. And, and they're not that toxic. If you've ever met anybody with a kidney transplant, a, a liver transplant, heart transplant, those people are on the same drugs. So it's not any worse than that. But again, wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to take those drugs? And another big problem, this is a big problem. When we were ready to do a hand transplant, we waited for a year and two months to find a donor. Because when somebody would die, we would go to their families and we'd say, look, you're donating your kidney and your liver and your heart. Would you please let us take the hand? And a lot of the families just, no. They imagine the face. Because they imagine that they'd be walking down the street and there's their loved one, you know, with somebody else's face and all that. I mean, so there was a lot of ethical questions that went into that. So, while this was a great thing, face transplant, you saw the results. I mean, those were fabulous results. But 
for the rest of their life they have to take those drugs. And it isn't that easy to get hands, donated hands. And it's the same problem as organs. There's 10,000 people in the United States today waiting in line to get a heart for a heart transplant. And they die while they're waiting in line. There just aren't enough organs. Okay, next, please. So, solution. When I moved to Germany, we made as the mission or the goal of our new laboratory, instead of transplanting hands, we're going to grow new hands. So, you get your hand cut off, we do something to make you grow a new hand. In that case, the donor problems, take an expression, it's your own hand, and to regrow faces. So that's what we're doing in Germany now. And this is the part of the presentation you guys haven't seen. <laughs> this is what I'm doing in Germany for the last four years. Okay, go next. So, what I say in this is, in nature, animals, and even we, know how to regenerate. We can do this. This is called a planaria, and have you guys had this yet? AP Bio high has school, it. We have. They're yeah. great. Yeah. These are the coolest little guys. They're about this big. Not many cells. <laughs> yeah, well, you cut it in half, guess what it does? It grows, this part grows a new head, and the other part grows a new tail. You cut it in four pieces, it grows four heads and four tails. You cut it in a hundred pieces, it grows a hundred new heads and a hundred tails. And I don't know who the guy was that did this experiment, but if you cut it into 279 pieces, it grows 279 heads and 279 tails. 280, doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that came up with that, I gotta, I gotta meet him one day and give him a prize. Because can you imagine cutting something that big into 280 pieces? But actually, the way they explain it is there's a certain load of stem cells. And when you get below a certain load, there's just not enough of them to generate it. I, I still, but see how after you cut it off, it's growing the two eyes? It's great. This, these things are great, and you can keep them in Tupperware. I mean, they're, 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 they're in the really easy to take care of, and they're fascinating. You know, one of the experiments we're trying, right? Well, I'm, in my mind, we haven't tried it yet, but think about this. Do you know what conditioning Pavlov and all that stuff is? Do you, you guys know what Pavlov is? You know, when you condition a dog, you ring a bell and you give him a cookie. You ring a bell and you give him a cookie. After a while, you just ring the bell, and he starts thinking he's going to get a cookie. You just conditioned him. You taught him something. So with these worms, one of the experiments we, I want to do, I haven't done it yet, is that they don't like the light. To shine light, they go off into the shadows. They really don't like light. So the experiment I want to do is you shine light, and then you hit the table. You shine light, hit the table. Finally, you don't even shine the light, hit the table, and they run off in the corner. Because you conditioned them, you taught them. Then you cut them in half and see if the new head knows that. Mm. Oh, cool. I haven't done it, but wouldn't that be Let cool? us know. <laughs> wow. Because that That's would true. say That's true. that all the cells have learned. Conditioned. Not just his head. That's a good, you guys should do that project. Oh, great. It's one of the many <laughs> These are really easy. Tell me how it goes. <laughs> Another animal, frog, you guys know frogs. Well, when they're little, when they're tadpoles, if you cut their tail off, it will grow back. Um, this is called a blastema. When you cut the tail off and it starts growing back, there's the magic, this is where the magic happens, and that's called a blastema. That's true. See, with certain stains, you can see those cells. Those are stem cells that are real active. So that's called a blastema. And no matter what you cut off and all these, when they regenerate, it's called a blastema. What's interesting about these is when they get older, they can't do it anymore. When they become frogs, if you cut off their leg or something, it won't do it anymore. Next. What about this guy? This is a salamander. These are famous for being to regenerate. You cut his leg off, it'll grow back. You can cut it off 50 times, it'll always grow back. 
Uh, Nick, start that video and turn off the sound once you start it, please. I don't have the sound. I don't think the sound's plugged well, yeah, okay, in. Would you good. need it? Then you, no, no, no. Okay. No, just, just click here. Okay, watch. How cool. They cut it off. Wow. Oh, this is there's the digits. Yeah. yeah, it's time lapse. And so they just took many, many pictures over a period of three weeks. And this is just animated. And uh, same thing. First of all, it heals just like if yeah. it was a wound, a normal wound. And then this is where the blastema starts. And if we knew what was going on in there, mm. many different stem cells come together here. Something that recently was discovered. You, have you guys studied stem cells? Yeah. And you know that when you have a bone stem cell, what does it turn into? Bone or cartilage or all the lineage okay. towards bone. Mm -hmm. If you have a muscle stem cell, it grows into muscle stem cells. If you have an embryonic stem cell, what does it grow into? You name it. Everything. Well, what happens in these is the cells that are there, you make the cut, some of them, which were in the bone, back up. They become embryonic. And they say, okay, what do we need here? And then they grow out to whichever is needed. That is amazing. We never thought that that would happen. So that means it can become like an embryonic stem cell. And that happens in all of these salamanders that regenerate. Why I'm, why I'm telling you this is, guess what? We're trying to figure out why can these guys do it? We can't do it. Mammals can't do it. A rat can't do it. A mouse can't do it. But these guys can do it. So when you're looking at that whole mechanism that they come back to being embryonic and then they develop into whatever's needed, we're thinking maybe if we could figure out why that is, we could turn that switch back on in mammals and learn to regrow new hands. Okay, next one. Okay, guess who else? <laughs> Every single year, these guys drop this in the forest. That's what they look like when they drop it. And look, it grows back. It's a blastema. Those are blastema. And I mean, this is every year. There's some of these moose that have racks that are huge. They almost break their legs because all the calcium, they take it away from all their bones. They're going up into those horns. It only takes a couple months. You can imagine how many. How much bone, how much calcium has to go up on top of his head? And then he walks out in the forest and it falls off. And it starts all over again the next year. Here's something really cool. Some guy in North Dakota did an experiment where in an animal like this, he drilled a little hole. Okay? Mm -hmm. Pay attention. He drills a hole right there. He lets it go. The next comes and it falls off. So where's the hole? Yeah. It's right in there. Mm -hmm. Falls off in the forest. Next year he follows that animal. Got out to this side. Right where the hole had been drilled here, it grew another spike. Oh, wow. Wow. What? Yeah. How, how come they It's remember? not even there. Yeah. It's in the forest on the ground. On the ground. So that shows you the message is not local. Central, somewhere down here, it knows that there was a damage there the year before. Those are the types of things we're studying in our research because it shows you what's the mechanism of doing it. That's the craziest thing. I had to read that paper five times. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And then I met a guy that worked with him on the project explaining, oh, no, that really happened. Wow. We have a I'm clue why that is. I have a question. Why are they? growing bigger every single year. They add one on each year. And, and in, in deer, it's an interesting thing because these are male deer. Mm -hmm. If you play with their hormones, mm -hmm. if, you, if you dampen the 
the amount of testosterone, they don't grow them as well. Okay. So it is also hormonal in these animals. If you take this stump yep. and you transplant it, transplanted okay. surgery down to the center here, you'll grow the horn out here. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. clearly is in, they weren't trying to make a unicorn. <laughs> but they've even done it down to the leg. They put it down to the leg and they'll grow a horn out the leg. If what, what they were looking at there is that information, that's where it is. Mm -hmm. It's at the base there. Okay, next. But the blastema, remember the blastema? In a little kid, before you are 10 years old, more or less, if I cut your, the tip of your finger off, guess what? It'll grow back. It'll grow back. Wow. It'll grow back. And if in a fetus, even earlier, you make a wound in a fetus, when they're born, you can't find them. You, can't, you really can't find them. It's perfectly healed. So again, we don't have to go and look at a salamander, planaria. I mean, in people this happens. But guess what? As you get older, it turns off. It's like we forget where the switch is thrown off. Okay, next. So, as I said before, these guys do not form blastema. That's a little cartoon of a blastema. <laughs> because we're mammals. We don't form blastemas. We just heal, and it's a stump. Scar, end of story. Next. So one of the things that has helped us study at the University of Irvine in California, a woman by the name of Susan Brandt, a great scientist, she did a study, and she looked at the fetus of one of these. Okay the fetus of a salamander, and looked at when it grew the first time. This is right when it's growing the first time. That happens to you, too. When you were a fetus, you grew a limb the first time. We all did, OK? She compared chemically what is happening in that tissue to when you cut it off and it grows back. She wanted to compare to say, what is different about this? What's different about when they grew it the first time? Because if you think about it, Mother Nature is pretty, she's pretty thrifty usually. She would not have a mechanism to grow a limb in utero and then have a totally different mechanism to grow it if it got cut off. I mean, she's pretty smart in terms of how she does things. So what Susan was trying to look for is that maybe if those are the same things, Guess what that implies? Next slide. We people, we grew it the first time too. So guess what? That information must be on our genome. We know how to grow with it because we did it. But there's something that doesn't turn on when we get older. And so that's part of our research. We're looking at the genome. We're looking at women. Luckily, the human genome's done. You guys know all about that. You study that. Well, some guy at the University of Kentucky has also next. Well, I'll show you another thing. He's also done the genome of salamanders. So guess what we can do? Okay, go, go ahead. Okay, this is our research in Louisville. I mean, in Frankfurt. Guess what we're focusing. The blastina. That's where the action is. That's where the magic happens. So we look at the blastema in different animals and we look at, we ask different questions. Some of the questions I already brought up to you. Next. The one I just mentioned at the University of Kentucky, Randall Voss has done the genome of this animal. He's done well, you know the human genome's been done. And of course the mouse genome was close to follow after the human genome. And what we, what we do is we compare them. And we compare the area with, that has the information about growing limbs. So what is different about this? Why does this one regenerate, this one doesn't, and that one doesn't? So that's 
is something we're very interested in next. Another thing we do, this is a stem cell. You probably haven't heard about it because there's just a few scientists working on this, but they're called very small embryonic-like cells. What do you think they mean by embryonic-like? just bone, not just muscle, not just... So they're embryonic-like. Something that's really strange about that is they literally look like this. And a normal cell, a normal stem cell, is about this big. It would be about seven microns across. These things are only two to five microns across. They're tiny little guys. And something that's even more amazing is they have almost no cytoplasm. It looks like all nucleus. And this scientist that we're working from this is a great story. I worked in Louisville for 20 years, and there's a scientist, a Polish guy across the street that I knew him, I never worked with him or anything. I had to move to Frankfurt and start reading articles, and all of a sudden I said, no, the guy that knows the most in the world about that is in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> across the street from my lab. So I had to go back to Kentucky and say, hey, look, you remember me? Yeah. Anyway, we're working together right now, and we think I told you that what's very interesting in the salamander is that the cell that was going to be a bone that kind of acts up and then does what's needed. These guys do that. And they've found them in all tissues. They've looked for them in many different tissues and they've found them. So they exist there. And what's even more cool is that three different investigators after somebody had a massive heart attack, they looked in the blood, and guess what they found? These guys in real high concentrations. They looked at a massively burned patient, somebody who's burned really bad. They looked in their blood. These are high concentrations. They looked at somebody who had a stroke, same thing. So there's something about injury that all of a sudden stimulates these cells to start coming out so we're studying these little guys. We've even taken some of these little guys, we cut off the limb of a rat, and we injected them in there. <laughs> you wouldn't believe what we're getting. We don't believe it yet. We have to do it over and over again to, to, to verify it, but we're getting growth that wasn't there before. So, okay, next slide. I'm almost finished, guys. Okay. okay. We also are involved in a clinical trial. A clinical trial, you know what clinical is, is when you're using it in humans. And what we do here, if you learned what an MSC is, a mesenchymal stem cell, it's a type of stem cell. They're really cool because they develop into all kinds of things and everything. We actually, in a patient who has a huge break, see that missing bone? If you guys break your bone, it's just a crack, it heals by itself. If you have a huge defect like this, it won't heal. It just overwhelms the system, it won't heal. So what we've studied this in rats, many, many rats, and what we do is we take a scaffold, you know what a scaffold is like on the outside of a building? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like a scaffold. Well, this is a material like a scaffold. First of all, we take bone marrow from the patient we grow out these stem cells, which are the stem cells that make bone. Once, it takes about two weeks to grow many, 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 many of them. Then, we operate on the patient. We put scaffold together with these stem cells, and it works. We're, we've, right now, we're, we've done the first six patients, and this is for safety to make sure that they're all safe and everything. After we get to 10, then we're going to start 100 patients where we actually do this. So this is called tissue engineering. Mm -hmm. Why engineering? Because it, the scaffold is like engineering a new bone. So there we're using stem cells again. Okay, next. Okay, another one that is really cool. Uh, we read an article, some guy in New York, an orthopedic surgeon many years ago, he cut the limbs of rats off, and then he put electricity, very low electricity, on it, and he got something that he describes as being new, a blastema. He calls it a blastema. Somebody else, 
by the name of Smith, reproduced it in another laboratory. He got the same thing, Siskin. There are several that reproduced it. This, these research were buried in the literature. Nobody was reading it. I stumbled upon it. Somebody told me about it. So guess what we're doing? That's one of our rats. We cut off the limb. We put in electricity, and look. Hmm. Usually that's flat. Yeah. So there's something happening there. Not as remarkable as this guy described it, but maybe we did something wrong, we did something different and everything. But the thing that we use those very small cells is even better than this, even further growth than this. So electricity plays a role in, in uh, regeneration. Next. Okay, this is, these are MSCs, the same cells I told you about, just so you see that these are real. Somebody a long time ago, cut the limb of a salamander off, and then he took a little probe and measured the amount of electricity that was coming out of there. Mm -hmm. That's accurate. On the side, a little bit in the middle, there's a lot of electricity coming out, a lot. It's very, very low voltage. So their electricity is involved in this. So what did we do? We got these MSCs, which form bone. We grew them out. These are them right here. And then we gave them electricity. Right now, they have no electricity. Nick, start the video. Okay, no electricity. When you see the plus and minus, all of a sudden the electricity starts. Uh-oh, there we go. Okay, no electricity, no electricity, no electricity. They're just hanging out. Okay, electricity. Wow. Oh, wow. <coughs> so those stem cells, they, they move when you give them electricity. So we're studying both in the rat, which is in vivo, and we're studying in, the, in, in vitro. In other words, when it forms that blastema, we take some of those cells out of that blastema and we put them in a petri dish and we expose them to uh, electricity to see what happens next. Am I way behind? A little bit. Okay. 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 Good. This it's fascinating. Doesn't work. This doesn't work. So anyway, so I won't show this one, but also this shows when the face forms. On one of these tadpoles, the face, there's a lot of electricity also when it naturally forms next. So that's what we do. We study the cells, the stem cells in blastema next. And so hopefully we will find the switch. That's where we're mm -hmm. looking for the switch to turn it They back know up. all about the switches. Yeah. <laughs> remember, we know how to do it. It's on our genome. We grew I wonder if it's part of the epigenome, though. I mean, it could be, that's right? Part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and we talked about that in class. It's just. Yep. Absolutely. So just yeah. There you go. So that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and coffee. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, girls. I don't know if you have questions. If you want to stay behind and give us some questions. Awesome. Yeah. I know some of them came the last time, so maybe yeah. you recall some of what was said yeah. uh, a couple years ago. Yeah. Really cool. So we're moving forward. This is going to be harder than transplanting. Yeah. <laughs> that switch is really hard to find. We'll find it. We found a lot in like two, three years. Yeah, well, it's been a lot. We've got some great scientists. What I do is I just call up the guys that have been doing this for 30 years and I said, can we work with you? <laughs> <laughs> So we're working with Poland, with uh, the United States, several labs in the United States. And clinical trials take, take decades. And that was already on in the making before I even got there. We just started clinical trials, but they started 10 years ago. Yeah. So, have, yeah. you, have you worked at all with uh, Wake Forest uh, University Tony. Hospital on the bladder growing? Tony. Tony, Tony and Tom. Yeah. He's a really good friend of mine. He did his residency in Louisville while I was there. My husband knows him very well. Yeah, and he's has a great huge, because uh, when we st first started talking about embryonic stem yeah, cells, he yeah. said, there's a guy doing work with not embryonic stem cells, but with regular cells yeah. that are no, growing Tony, wires. Tony is considered the best in the world phenomenal. in tissue engineering. Scaffold, yeah. They do the same thing. They same scaffold thing. it, and they, they attach the cells really to the scaffold, and make new bladders with people. He's a really neat guy. Yeah, he's been pretty darn cool and he's done. Him. He's done bladders. You guys know what bladder is, urinary bladder. Yeah, he yeah, literally grew it on the bench. Grew it on the bench with the cells from yeah. that patient, took the bad one out, put it in there, and those guys are 10 years out now. Yeah. Wow. He, for a penis, That's, he grew mm -hmm. the inside also, little babies. 
five of them doing well, and they just reported last week a vagina. Ooh. Five women, they're eight years out. Wow. So I mean, this That's is really all tissue engineering. Tissue engineering, yeah. And it's real, it's in people, it's not in rats. Right. Yeah, it's not the external arm. I mean, I imagine an arm is far more complex. And that's the hardest, but, because yeah. there's so many different So many different things. Not just Nerves, vessels. Yeah, so. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's something. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you, girls. We really need to think of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah.